Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for another hour of answering your gardening questions. Give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. Picture questions and emails get sent to byf at unl.edu. Attach those as JPEGs and those emailed questions get answered on a future show. Do be sure to tell us as much as you can about your question, including where you live, or I will send you a follow-up question. And remember, you can follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So Tom, your very first appearance with a very interesting insect. Yes, this is a stag beetle. And you notice how it just, well, you can't see it yet, but this Soup. is a stag beetle. There we go. It's all perked up and it's watching my finger and it wants to actually pinch. So let's see if we can get a uh, kind of view of the mandibles. This is a male stag beetle. And they come out like in May or June and he's got these huge, ridiculously big mandibles. And that's for fighting other males over a female. So he emerges, he gets up on a log, they reproduce in rotting wood. So he just sits there in his little log and he waits for another male to come along or a female. If another male comes along, they get in a big fight with these big mandibles. The loser leaves, the winner gets to mate with the female. And she'll lay her eggs out in rotten wood. And then these things that look like white grubs develop in the rotting wood for up to two to three years and then an adult comes out. So it's a really neat life cycle, very beneficial insect, it's a recycler. You should have brought two so we could have, you know, seen the fight. Bets. Well, he wants to fight my finger. He's been doing that. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tom. Okay, Bill. All right. Well, I wasn't really sure what I was going to bring tonight. And then I was walking around my turf plots and I found something to bring. So this is, um, if you look at this leaf of tall fescue, you'll see these like kind of um, white dots, like blumps all over the leaf. And uh, this is a slime mold. And this is a kind of a cool, um, I guess I won't say pathogen, it's just a fungi, and it's growing on the surface of the leaf. And uh, Laura and I were talking about it and um, doing some reading about it, and they just uh, feed on all of the, the you know, sugary goodness on the uh, surface of the leaf. So like the exudate the, that's coming out of the leaves, um, other bacteria, other fungi, other organic matter that's wet and, and good to eat. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then another thing I just wanted to talk about a little bit tonight was now we're getting into uh, 4th of July weekends coming up here and you might be going out of town and you're wondering, what do I do with my lawn? Because uh, if I'm gonna be gone for a week, do I you know, mow it really short or do I mow it like normal? And what we wanna do is just mow it like you normally would the day you're gonna leave or the day before. Um, you don't wanna scalp it down because if you scalp it, you're gonna open it up to uh, diseases and, and, uh, and weeds, especially like crabgrass. And then also, um, it actually grows faster. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but by scalping it down, you freak the grass out and it just starts to bolt out of the ground and grow like crazy. So just mow it like normal. And if it's a little long, you know, maybe mow it a, a notch higher the next time you get back from your vacation. Awesome, thanks, Bill. All right, you have turf also, Lauren. Get a little double turf sample night here tonight. So uh, uh, I brought along it with the forecast over the next week uh, and current warmer conditions, we're sure gonna see a lot of brown patch showing up. So I've got some earlier symptoms of brown patch along tonight and you can kind of see on the leaf blades, uh, that's just great photo work. Uh, you can kind of see those kind of gray ashen, uh, irregular shaped lesions on the leaf blades. This will mostly be a problem in fescue lawns under real severe conditions and really favorable conditions. You can see it in bluegrass. Um, as those continue to develop though, then you'll see they'll kind of get darker with the margin. So this one right here, I don't know if we can get that one. Um, kind of see a little darker, I'm trying to get my finger right. Maybe not, that might not work. They'll just get a little bit darker around the edge, but always irregular in shape. Uh, they won't always go across the, the leaf margin itself. And that's how you kind of identify brown patch. It's always in the, in the turf, usually uh, overhead irrigation is gonna aggravate it in the evening, so water in the morning. Uh, avoid any fertilization uh, just to aggravate it during the warmer months, like Bill would recommend anyway, just for normal turf management. And then if you really wanna control it, uh, a lot of the different fungicides that you would find at the garden center, something with Michael Butenil, for example, a uh, really good product. All right, thank you, Lauren. 
John, your sample will not fit on the camera, I'm afraid. It, it, it won't, so it's not grass, <laughs> right? So, uh, so I uh, you know, have this little uh, weird looking flower here, but it's actually a, attached at the bottom here, we have a, a nice garlic bulb. Uh, so this is a, a full garlic plant and it's, it's time to start harvesting garlic. So you would have planted it in the fall, like last October, and then once it starts to turn brown like this is when you start harvesting it. And then you wanna hang it up and let it dry for a few weeks, preferably in a warm, dry area, uh, and then you can store it in a cool, dry area. Uh, and this is a hard neck garlic, so this is not one of those where you can do the fancy braid uh, and hang it up in your kitchen and be really pretty. You just have to hang this up somewhere. But actually, the hard neck garlics actually store longer than the soft neck garlic, so uh, that's okay. And then um, if you uh, let the, the scape develop this flower, uh, which you really should cut it off. It'll actually give you larger garlic bulbs. If you really wanted to, uh, you could pull off these little, uh, little gross on there, and they're actually tiny little garlic uh, bulbils is what we call them, and you could actually start those. It'll take a few years to get full-size garlic, uh, but uh, you can see those. They're, they're little, little propagules, little things. They're not seeds. Uh, but uh, they're very interesting, so, uh, or you can put that in a salad too. Do whatever you want to with it. Perfect, thank you, John. All right, guys, let's start with pictures. You get the first couple, Tom. Okay. This is actually from two different viewers, and we've seen this uh, from a, a number of other people too. Um, Loop County is the first one, wonderful old elm. It's been a bit scraggly, but this year it looks like this. Um, and then we had a second one that essentially had the same lacing, and th that's actually her big old elm there, so you can see that it's got some issues as aside from the fact that something's eating it. And this is our other viewer who sent in a picture of what's left of those leaves on the elm. So what do we think we have munching away on those? I'm sorry, Kim, I was playing with the beetle. <laughs> So what do we? <laughs> no, this, this is, you got this me. This is a pest that showed up probably about 10, 15 years ago in uh, eastern Nebraska, Europe European elm flea weevil. Mm -hmm. And it's the adults are neat little insects. Well, except when they're eating your plants, but they're they're tiny weevil-like insects, so they got the elongated head, but they also have large femurs, so they're capable of jumping, so they get that name flea weevil but they are herbivores. So they have one generation a year, the adults are out on the leaves, uh, they emerge from overwinter, uh, mate, females go to a leaf, they lay their eggs, she'll lay her eggs right into a vein in the leaf. Now the, the larvae, uh, just little kind of white wiggly things, live between, they're leaf miners actually, so they'll start mining through the leaf and they'll get to the edge of the leaf and expand it. So on those samples, there's like a brown blotch and the brown blotches get bigger and bigger. And then they pupate in that, the males emerge, and, or males and females, the adults emerge, and they start feeding on the leaf, and they start to chew holes, this shotgunning. And if you have a high enough population, it makes this like lace-like appearance that was in those trees. Now the feeding really is not harming the tree, and um, they'll disappear after a little bit of feeding, they'll go off and they'll, they'll prepare for the winter, and you won't see them again until next spring. And, you know, if control is really not an issue. How would you, how would you just, control them no, on a big tree like that? No, anyway. you just, I mean, yeah. insecticide will be used from time to time, but if you got a big tree, um, I just let it go. All right, thanks, Tom. All right, Bill, you have a couple of different turf ones and not a whole lot of information. Um, they're both what are these spots in my lawn? Mm -hmm. This particular person says she does have a dog, but this is probably not dog spot. Yeah, so, some interesting things about this one is, uh, well, first of all, it's pretty high up picture. Um, so it's like going to the doctor's office and have to cough and expecting a <laughs> diagnosis. Like it's <laughs> hard to say from there. Um, and this is the second one. The second think. one we kind of looked at, we've been seeing a lot of this disease. It's normally found in like golf turf on like really short on mowing height called dollar spot. This could be that. We have been seeing some of it on, on bluegrass lawns this weekend with the cool and all the rain, mm -hmm. the cooler weather, you know, and the high humidity. So that might be uh, what that is. And that's a situation where it's a foliar disease that you're just gonna be able to, uh, to mow it off. I wouldn't recommend treating because the damage has kind of been done already. And now that we're heating back up, um, the relative humidity are gonna drop because of that heating. And so uh, I wouldn't expect to see that. But keep an eye out for things like the brown patch like Lauren talked about. 
that could be something that we should start to see uh, with the heat becoming a lot, a lot more severe. Um, and then deciding, you know, how you're managing your turf. If you're not managing it in a healthy fashion, then it's going to be more susceptible to those types of pests. All right, and that second one was in Neely, so it's a little further north, but whether that makes any difference. Yeah, well, all that. the rain that they had and the yeah. humidity, I'd still would say that it would be a good shot at that. I've yeah. seen it on, I've, sometimes when it <laughs> breaks out on, tall, on bluegrass, it really does a number, um, but it's kind of rare when it does actually happen. Okay, thanks, Bill. All right, so Lauren, we had a couple of these come in this week for the first time this year. Um, the first is from Shenandoah, Iowa, and uh, she thought it was a pepper or a carrot that somebody had dropped off in her flower bed, but she thinks she really knows what it is. And then we have a second one too, who said finally a fungus that looks like Beautiful. this among us as opposed to the dog vomit that she had earlier. So what are these? Uh, these are stinkhorns. Yeah. So beautiful little uh, fungi that are just out there breaking things down. Um, the interesting thing about those is that if you find them early, a lot of times people call in and say they think they found snake eggs when they form mm -hmm. on the ovule, the developing structure of that fruiting structure uh, in, in there. So they can look last year's videos and look up snake eggs and mm -hmm. see my video that looks like mm -hmm. And we had monster egg. numbers of calls on stinkhorns last yeah, year, but haven't had them, them yet. Yep. So. Stinkhorn. All right, thanks. Don't worry Lauren. about it. <laughs> okay, John, you get what looks like a rotten tomato oh, from no. Woodbine, Iowa. Um, they are potted, and they're both, and so you can see they're potted kind of in the ground, but she has pictures of the maters themselves with classic. Blossom and rot. Right, so that is blossom and rot, and that is one of the weird ones because it's not really a disease, mm -hmm. it's a disorder. Uh, and what happens is that it's actually a calcium deficiency in the fruit. So if you want to know the technical jargon of it, uh, the structure of the fruit is held together with something called calcium pectinate, like pectin like you make jelly with. So that holds the fruit together. So if we don't have enough calcium in there, we get breakdown of the tissue and it, and it starts to rot. So it can be caused by a few things. The most common one is actually irregular watering. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of rain or we have lots of dry period and we need the water to come up into the plant to bring the calcium from the soil. If we don't have rain, we don't have that calcium. If we have too much water, we damage the root hairs on the root that take up the calcium and the water. So that is the number one cause. It could also be too much nitrogen and the plant grows so fast that it can't take up enough calcium. Mm -hmm. And the least likely cause is that you don't have enough calcium in the soil. And uh, people automatically go to that and that is not usually the answer. All so. right. I like Thanks, this, Steve. talking physiology and <laughs> right. soils you here. Know. What is this? I like it. <laughs> right, right. Well, there we go. can't do that in the lightning round, just a reminder. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> no, don't but, tell him that. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I, still, I still haven't won the lightning win. round. <laughs> right. you know. Okay, for our first feature tonight, we once again will encourage you to get ahead of some of our more common pest problems this time of year. Here's Kyle Broderick and Jim Kalish to help us with disease and insect tips. It's early summer now, and we're in the immaculate, glorious backyard farmer garden, kind of checking out to see what, where the pests might be, both chewing insects and plant diseases. And we want you to know what you ought to be looking for right here and now, this time of the year. Yep, man, as things are starting really to pop this summer, it, as with some of that excess moisture that we've gotten the past couple of weeks, would expect to see quite a few more rot spots and other things showing up this time insects, of year. Insects, right, the chewers and the, all kinds of insects. Indeed. In fact, so many you ought to be looking for, but we can only give you a few examples. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a look right now to see what I can find. Ah, good luck, hope you find something. Okay, see you later. Well, as far as disease management goes this time of year, one of the big things we're going to want to be focusing on is going to be moisture. So even though we've had a fair amount of moisture recently, really want to make sure we're getting some consistent watering happening. Anytime that we have um, in, that we're intermitting uh, drought stress with excess moisture stress for those plants, they're going to be a lot more susceptible to various diseases. You also want to make sure that you're avoiding that overhead irrigation. So as best you can, water from the ground so as we're not splashing spores upright onto the, some of these lower leaves. The other big thing we want to focus on this time of year is as plants are getting quite a bit bigger, starting to put off some fruit, we want to make sure that we are adding the proper support 
as for these plants. So we have our tomato cages, we have our trellises up, things like that. Anything that prevents that fruit from lying on the ground or any of those stems from coming in contact with the ground, that's really going to help minimize disease pressure towards the end of the year. Also, biggest thing whenever it comes for disease management or even pest ma uh, insect management, you want to know what you're dealing with. And so if you are just seeing random spots, random things chewing, we recommend that you submit a sample to the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic so we can try to figure out exactly what the cause is so you're not putting out an unnecessary product and wasting your own time and money. I mentioned beetles and mites in early summer and this is a time of year where they really increase so you need to be out in the garden looking at early signs of their damage. Now, of the three beetles that are most important right now would be Japanese beetle, if you've had a history of Japanese beetle grub problems in your turf, this is the time to be putting on your insecticides. Now for those adults that get on the flowers and the fruits and everything like that and congregate and cause damage, a good time to treat those is with pyrethrins in the evening hours or with neem oil, but not during the daytime. Too much risk to pollinators. And then we have uh, bean leaf beetle, and they ought to be coming out that first generation in the summer, causing holes in the leaves. We have cucumber beetles attacking cucumbers, two species there. Same kind of strategy, use pyrethrin sprays in the evening hours when most of the blossoms are all closed up, the pollinators are gone, and that will be effectively reduce their numbers. And then as for mites, now we have the chigger mites that are starting to reach their peak this time of the year. Remember that don't go into weedy areas, don't go into tall grass areas or the edges of tall grass areas because that's where you're gonna pick them up. Keep your lawn mowed and put on some kind of repellent and you'll be okay. And then the fine, final one that we tend to have in the early to mid summer will be spider mite problems. When you first see that stippling on the leaves, remove those leaves. And then in the course of, uh, of an infestation, if it gets to be too difficult, then you can apply an insecticidal soap or horticultural spray oil again in the evening hours when it is cool and so there won't be that much stress on the plants. Well, Kyle, there's certainly a wealth of information that we can share with our viewers regarding insects and diseases, uh, but there's still a lot more yet to know, right? So oh, way more than we can discuss today, unfortunately. So you can certainly contact us in our respective departments or even send your emails to backyardfarmer.unl.edu. You know, there really is a lot more to cover. We can only give you so much information on the show. So the key is to know those plants. Keep a sharp eye out for some of those common pests. That's that walk in the park thing. Go look. Go look every day, even if it's hot, right? Right. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look down. And here are some peach tree woes for you to open peach your eyes on. Woes. Yeah, big woes, in fact. So, ooh, ooh yeah. And we batted this back and forth, but you get the first hit. You ain't making cobbler out of that. No. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's possible an insect was involved in this, and we'll kick it down to Lauren here in a minute. And, but. So an insect could potentially feed on this, cause some sort of a breach in the, the skin of the peach, and a secondary infection could occur, some sort of fungus or, or I won't even pretend to know. Some sort of rot or spot can get into that. <laughs> so what, what could potentially feed on it? There's several things that potentially could. Uh, stink bugs are certainly a possibility. Oriental fruit moth is a possibility, but the timing seems a little bit off. One thing you would find with oriental fruit moth is a little bit of uh, young twig dieback before you might see them entering the peaches. But um, really without knowing, it's hard to say what you can do about it. Now, there is a possibility it's a rot, right? Well, any, anytime you get a feeding site like that, right. you'd have potential for infection. So if you really want to manage fruit trees and have great quality fruit, you really want to look at a fruit tree spray schedule with mm -hmm. insecticides and fungicides and dormant sprays. And, the works. and be consistent in your... Yeah. Yes. Right. It's hard to do get good fruit in a yard. It is. That's it, why farmer's markets were invented. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Bill. So this is a Hastings viewer. Okay. Uh, they have a patch of a foreign grass in their turf, in their fescue. Uh, they want to know if it can be identified from the pictures, mm -hmm. what can be done to control it and when would be the best time to do it? Yes, yeah, always tough to identify grasses from the pictures because you have to look really closely at the leaves. But on this one, 
I'm leaning towards a grass that's usually desirable at a golf course, um, putting green. This is probably creeping bent grass, a cool season perennial that we see at golf course putting green, sometimes on fairways and tees. Uh, can tolerate very low mowing, below a tenth of an inch on a putting green. It's a pretty amazing plant. Um, but it's in the lawn, it's a weed, and um, so you're kind of limited on what your options are because it's in a cool season weed. Um, it's going to be a non-selective type of uh, an approach to try to, to kill, kill it um, that way. There are selective herbicides like um, Tenacity, Mesotrione, but if you're going to do Tenacity, you have to do three sequential applications on like a 14 to 21 day spacing. If you miss that interval, you're just wasting your money and your time. Okay, it just bleaches the plant out till it runs out of sugar and dies. So if you're gonna do that type of route, you know, I'd probably recommend getting a, a professional to do it. And that application would be uh, in the fall after the summer heat uh, stress has kind of weakened the plant. All right, thank you, Bill. Okay, Lauren, you have two different P&E questions. The first is actually from the state of Washington. Um, let's see, this is, we have herbaceous peonies, some 50 or more years old. So we have this one and then we have another one that's quite yellow. We may have, I may have gotten those a little mixed up, but look at those two. Okay, so the two, the, the first one that had the, the leaf lesions and the flowers that are browning, and I think in, in one of the descriptions it said some of the flowers would blight and dry right. up and you can see yep. one there. Uh, Botrytis is a fungus that will often do this. Uh, so some things with that, if you have them and it's an older planting, it sounds like doing some sanitation will help with that, avoid overhead irrigation, uh, those types of things. Now the other one, uh, if we can go to that picture, when we see chlorotic plants like this, and, and I think there was also some stunting involved possibly if I look, when I was looking at the image, uh, the thing that comes to mind with this, and they indicated no herbicides were involved. So herbicide drift, there are some herbicides that could do this. Uh, but where it, it, it appears to be an individual plant, uh, I'm really thinking it's a virus. So I would watch this closely. If you see it, that it's isolated to the plant for sure, and it's stunted, then that would be a time to rogue that plant out and make sure it's not spreading and you're not moving it as you do pruning and clean up and things like that. So that one I would just watch carefully and see if it's coming out stunted, stays that way, and it's an isolated plant, I would rogue it out. All right, thank you, Lauren. 50 years old is a long time. That's a long time for, yeah. but sometimes they're great. They are, so. okay. All right, John, you have one, two, three. It's okay. tomato time. <laughs> so the first is a midnight snack, which uh, <coughs> curling, 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 wonders what that is. Um, this, and that's in Lincoln. The second is Southwest Wayne <coughs> County. Plants started to show this kind of damage about two weeks ago, no sprays. Um, Different plants in different locations 15 feet away are not showing this. And the third one is in Grand Island, Mama Rosa tomatoes growing in Grand Island with problems. Right. Disease, environment, or herbicide? My guesstimate is going to be environment. I'm thinking this is a, a weather-related disorder, so we could have you know, some, some root damage from all the excess rain that we've been having in places, so we can get some wilting and curling looking like that. But we can also get some curling in relation to heat, especially uh, with some of them. I think one was in a pot and the roots would get warm as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think all of those are, are weather related. I don't think there's a disease or a, a, an herbicide drift issue going on with any of those. All right, and, and it does seem like from all over the state, whether they're in a pot or various cultivars, we're all getting these curly things going right. on. Yeah, all right, thank you, John. Well, one of the satisfying things about our garden is donating the produce to needy causes. This week, Terry James tells us it's time to start harvesting and coordinating the donation process. Let's take a minute to see what's happening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're talking about what we're doing in the Backyard Farmer Garden when it comes to our chow garden. So remember chow is choosing Healthy Our Way, working with the Snap Ed group and growing plants for food banks and pantries here in the East Campus area. We've been harvesting a little bit of our produce, our early chards, lettuces, those kinds of things that have gone off uh, with produce from the heart. This week we start our big harvest. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff ready in our garden, but now we're asking all the homeowners to bring their produce too. 
So on Tuesday nights from 5 to 7, you can come to the Backyard Farmer Garden, talk to Master Gardeners, bring your extra zucchinis, onions, peppers, tomatoes, whatever you have extra in your garden that you can't use, bring it here, they'll weigh it. Produce from the Heart will come pick it up on Tuesday nights, take it to the local food bank or pantry, and we will be helping to feed some of those people that really could use some of those fresh produce in our area. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden on Tuesdays from five to seven with your extra produce. We're fortunate to be able to have that fun, healthy garden that we can give our abundance of produce to those who need it. And everybody here at Backyard Farmer encourages you to do the same with your excess fruits and vegetables. No sense in putting them in the compost pile. All right, so just regular old questions, Tom. Okay. This comes from Grand Island. Worms about three quarters of an inch to an inch long all over the side of the house, the drive, the walks, especially after a rain. They have come into the house. Um, what can she do? How to control or is it necessary? Uh, first thing I want to figure out what it is. My first thought is maybe millipedes. It could be, you know, wire worms potentially, something like that coming out with the very saturated ground. But really, there's no reason to do any spraying. Uh, the best thing to do is just get it a shop back and vacuum these things up. All right. Thank you. So, Bill, mm -hmm. we have a Seward viewer who wants to know whether there are any buffalo grass lawns in the Lincoln area that viewers <laughs> could look at as an example. Sure. So, if you come down to the Backyard Farmer Turf Garden, exactly, which you can uh, <laughs> search on your phone um, on a map app, um, it will take you to our research plots, and we have nine different grasses there that are maintained as lawns. So if you just come on in, you'll see the signs. It's right off 38th and Huntington, and you'll see a whole bunch of different grass out there, the research plots. Feel free, walk around, check it out. Uh, please don't wreck them. And uh, you know, take a look at uh, the buffalo grass and um, all the other grasses that are growing in Nebraska right now. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Okay, um, Lauren, this is a Malcolm viewer. Mushrooms. South of the bank, running down to a pasture, there's a row of huge mushrooms that appeared last week. He's never had, it's never happened before, no rotten wood in that area. Any idea what they are? Um, it is, it's been warmer too, it, it's a little early, but Lepiota species are ones that tend to come out in large, they're very large caps, so, so look up um, Lepiota and see if that is a match. Without a picture, it's hard to say. Are those the parasol looking things? Parasol mushrooms, yes. Okay. Really large. If it's a really big cap, that's what it could be. Yeah, pretty cool. Sometimes you'll get mushrooms growing to also in response to thatch. So, huh. all right. Check the grass out too. Okay, John, this is an Omaha viewer who um, has endless summer hydrangeas, mm -hmm. one pink and one blue, and wants to know when the best time is to transplant them. Well, usually what I tell people when transplanting woody plants like that, you definitely want to wait until they are dormant. Uh, so I would wait, uh, you know, you can wait until fall or even later into winter uh, and, and transplant those. So you, you want to reduce the shock as much as possible. So do it when it's not actively growing. Exactly. Wow. Excellent. All right, John, are you ready? I'm ready to win it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have from the Lus Hills, when should the lower leaves of Brussels sprouts be removed? Only when you harvest. Perfect. Is there a way to keep mulberry trees from fruiting? Cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> should you use manure fertilizer from animals that have fed on pastures that were treated with grazon? I would say no, and if you're using manure, you need to have a waiting period for food safety purposes. Excellent. What causes rhubarb that was bought and planted red to lose its red color and become white? Uh, it just it changes with age, so you can, can dig it up and divide it or get new plants. All right. Um, this is a Northeast Nebraska viewer who bought a house with a linden that was in a tree box. Mm -hmm. Should they remove the box, and if so, but how? Uh, yes, you definitely want to remove the box and, and you know, take it off and, and, and uh, you know, if there are roots that are grown up in it, you, you might have to, to make sure they're still covered with soil. All right, a viewer bought a fall gold raspberry and they got some last year and this year they're red and tiny and icky, why? Because it was grafted and the top cyan part died off and it came back from the rootstock. 
Nice job. That was a go. six with an asterisk. You weren't wow. reading the question by the time it. <laughs> and then and they <laughs> counted the one he asked. Yeah, the what is up with this? Okay. All right, and so the competition Work begins. People. Right, yeah. Come I'm going to just answer two questions. <laughs> okay, just two. Let really me pick out depth. the worst ones. All right. <laughs> We know. have a Geneva viewer, Lauren, who says they have rust on their green beans, on the beans themselves. What can be done about it at this time, if anything? Well, if you've got green beans you're harvesting, it's going to be really hard to control. If, if it is actually bean rust, uh, there's a couple things. Avoid overhead irrigation first. Uh, you may have to actually use a fungicide in that situation if it's severe, but I hate to see people do that in a backyard garden. Okay. I would just grow a different one. So, Sanitation when you start over, if okay. you go fall crop. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> the life cycle. <laughs> we have a carny Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> who sent us a picture of a Cleveland Select ornamental pear with beautiful orange spots on the foliage. Okay. What would that be and what to do about it? Well, that would be rust also. And um, it is going to cycle. So at this point, uh, the life cycle of rust, since I'm only answering two questions tonight <laughs> in the lightning round, <laughs> it's not going to repeat, so you don't need to spray it. It's going to, I'm not exactly sure where that rust is going to cycle over to, but you don't want to do anything to it at this point. And on that note, mm -hmm. new rain, new crop of mushrooms in the lawn, how to get rid of them? Really hard to manage mushrooms in the lawn. Almost nothing you can do unless you know what they're growing on. So if there's organic matter you can remove, that's fine. Thatch control is really important as well because there's a lot of little haymaker mushrooms, they call them, or uh, lawnmower mushrooms are even referred to. And many times that's what people see. Perfect. They do have psilocybin <laughs> in them, and you do not want to eat them. <laughs> well, that's all we this, have time for today. Yeah, right? <laughs> it was an hour over. This but is that's <laughs> great advice. <laughs> really, you right. set the bar so high, I knew I was going to lose. I was, <laughs> all right. I have 30 seconds. Bill, <laughs> yeah. Bill we're, we actually are doing lightning. Okay. You ready? Can't, this is central Nebraska. They want to know if the bare spots in their turf can be overseeded now with any success whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, no, I'd say no. I mean, you, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we have a garden center in the eastern part of the state that said uh, in this hot weather, the turf should be sh syringed when it is hot. That's completely wrong. Do not water your lawns in the afternoon to cool them off unless you see visible drought, in which case you'd like to water uh, that next morning. All right. We have a Raymond viewer who wonders about how to control ragweed in their yard. Mow it. Okay. When should tenacity be applied to a new buffalo grass or any other kind of new lawn? You know, uh, tenacity is pretty safe on, the, on most of our seedings, but uh, get a couple mowings in on it, and then you can do the tenacity app. It would be good for the uh, annual uh, weed control like crabgrass. All right. It's how a do good you. Time. This, You're not going to win. <laughs> this is a Neely viewer who wants to know how <laughs> to get rid of ash tree seedlings in the lawn. Mow them. All right. How do you actually kill Creeping Charlie? Uh, with uh, herb, two herbicide applications in the fall, three-way combination type products. Nice job. That's pretty good. Hey, Tom. It's up to me to get two. <laughs> Lauren failed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you so. can do it, Tom. Let's talk life cycles. <laughs> yeah. Starting right out, we have a Fremont viewer who is growing miniature corn and has earworms in it, big ones. Anything they can do at this point? Uh, I'd hand pick them out. Go back to leaf tip or ear tips and grab them and pull them out, but they have a really interesting life cycle <laughs> that we should talk about. And let's not. <laughs> Do milkweed bugs damage the plants? Uh, milkweed bugs like to feed on the seeds, and no, I mean, they're part of the milkweed ecosystem, so All right. let them be. We have, a, we have a viewer who wants us to identify a pure white moth with wings that are folded to look like a fighter jet. Ooh. Any well, idea? Aerodynamic. Top gun. Yeah. Remake's coming out. It's a uh, probably a tiger moth. Tiger moth. Yeah. All right. A McClelland, Iowa viewer wants to know whether they should pick and squish Japanese beetles or drown them in soapy water. Well, there's always a great thrill of the kill with squishing them, but it's probably you're better off throwing them in a bucket of soapy water. There's some debate whether or not the odors from a squished beetle might attract more. But uh, there's not great evidence that it does. Just just drown them. That's a good thrill of the kill. So. All right. Good thing for anybody who wants to have children or grandchildren 
It's a great activity, family fun time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks guys, that was quite interesting. So Tom, you I and I say. together answered as many as John. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Up, well, Bill tied me, so we have to have, you know, like some, a, a tiebreaker around. Well, uh, that's it, because I'm guessing that nobody knows what those plants are except you, and you know because I told you. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, what are the not, plants not, of the week? They're not cucumbers and tomatoes, oh. I don't know what the hell. Uh, <laughs> no. So we, we have uh, two plants this week from the Backyard Farmer Rain Gardens. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have uh, Mary Washington's plume, which is this uh, pink number right here. Martha. Uh, oh, yes, Mary Washington's plume. Uh, uh, or Martha. See, you didn't even write it down. I right? know. Right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what this plant is, right? <laughs> um, it's Philopendula venusta, and that's why the scientific name is important. That's because we right. can call it whatever we want to as long as we have that name right. Uh, so it's up to eight feet tall uh, in a rain garden. Uh, and it loves moist soil and full sun, so, uh, and it has fragrant foliage, which is, it's, is nice. And the other one is actually a fringed sedge, so you see the, the spiky green growth here, and so we have these uh, interesting uh, 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 growths here, so uh, this is from the rain garden as well. It's evergreen, slowly spreading, and I think that's a, a really interesting plant there, uh, and it has these unusual dangling flowers. Mm -hmm. And both of those are truly in the bottom of the rain garden. So right. anybody who has those flooded areas that hold water for 24 to 48 hours, these, these will uh, survive in those conditions. Right, so go out and look right now. Exactly. <laughs> and see where the water them. is and plant these there. Exactly. <laughs> it looks great right now. It does, it does. look great yeah. right now. All right, so we now have picture number three. Okay. This is really fun because we have three different, what are these guys? Ooh. Two people sent this one in and the first one said, this insect is eating a Japanese beetle yes. from Bellevue. The second viewer who sent in a, a picture of the same creature saw mm -hmm. it on her linden tree and she's in Lincoln. Okay. So what are those? Those are, they're a group of assassin bugs called wheel bugs. Mm -hmm. Assassin bugs are great predators in general and obviously it was doing a great job of eating an evil Japanese beetle. Perfect, and then the third one is from uh, Blair, and they thought it was a baby mantis, which it is not. What is that? That is also an assassin bug nymph. So the stages you saw before were nymphs, not, an Im not a mature adult, and this is like a first instar or second instar, just hatch out of the egg and is out looking for food. Excellent, pretty cool. Yeah. All right, um, Bill, this is actually from Rosalie, Nebraska, okay. which is in the northeast part of the state. I don't know that we've ever gotten any. The first is, uh, he says, this is what his turf looks like after he mows it. Why is the grass so brown at the bottom? And he did say that his mower is set as high as it can be. And then the second one is the lighter grass. This is also the same, the same viewer, and he's wondering if this is a type of crabgrass. So a couple really interesting turf yeah, issues here. These, these last two we don't think are crabgrass. Um, we're thinking maybe that would be a zoysia. Um, again, really hard to see without actually having it in my hand and to, to identify it. Um, uh, if the grass was, was light colored in the, the spring and slower to green up and then looks like this, that's um, what that could be. I'm not sure, I don't think it's a cool season grass though. And um, the first one, if you're mowing as high, I, I guess I missed that part in the question. I thought it was mowed short, like scalping. So uh, if it's mowed really high and has that color, it could just be something with a, um, you know, maybe not being fertilized properly, and so it's just not you know a robust enough turf stand. And so when you mow it, it just doesn't look thatchy. Maybe that well, it could be some thatch, but it, it, it I don't know. This was a this was a tricky one for me. So I'm maybe sorry. that one needs to go to extension. <laughs> yeah, up in so that part of the state. Yep, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, thanks, Bill. All right, so you get uh, another turf question, Lauren. It's turf. Uh, in fact, two of them, but it is two of the same, and a dozen or so dark gray spots in the lawn that look like footprints, and then the mold or whatever it is easily wipes off. This is Seward. The other one is in Lincoln. So that looks exactly like what Bill brought in and talked it about does. early in the show. So if you didn't tune in early, you can go back and listen to that. But that's slime mold, mm -hmm. and uh, you could just wash it off. Yeah, just it's no worry cool, about really. it. I mean, Wonderful the... organisms. Yeah, we yeah. we're hoping to have the first annual plant pathology slime mold race here later this year. <laughs> and naming them. That's yeah. going to be the best part. <laughs> we got a student really interested in slime mold. <laughs> All right, John. Um, this is a viewer who has a damaged red bud. 
uh, lived seven or eight years or a few years. Storm took the main trunk out. I think our viewers can see that main trunk mm -hmm. in there. Uh, obviously, this is the spring picture where it uh, sprouted from the base, grew beautifully. They're wondering whether they should go ahead and take it completely out or whether they should try to actually um, train this into either a single stem or a multi-stem tree. Right, so yeah, this one's a, a tough one. Uh, and, and what I would suggest is number one, we have that dead trunk sitting in there. So get that out uh, because that can really be an avenue for insects and diseases to get into the rest of the tree. So take that out, get it out as much as, as you can. And then I would pick maybe three uh, or four of those better uh, trunks that are coming up and train it into some sort of, uh, you know, attractive uh, bush. I don't know that you will get it to a, a single leading stem just because they'll never grow upright. Uh, and red buds really, you know, they like to be that wandering uh, sort of, you know, they, they don't really care. So they, they, you know, just, just pick three or four and, and go with it. All right. Excellent. Thanks, John. Well, we had a fantastic time a couple weeks ago in South Sioux City as we took a look at a community garden. The fun didn't stop there. We were also treated to visit an orchard that will have a new learning center overlooking the fruit trees. Well, South Sioux has an established community garden project that we work on. and. And those community gardeners actually were looking for fruit trees and they thought maybe if the park system had fruit trees, they could harvest them. So that's really where it kind of came from. Um, we then had, of course, the city had this 10 acre site, so we decided to put an actual community orchard in. So that was in 2014, we planted the garden, this, this orchard. And uh, we have a, a large variety of uh, different trees in here for apples, pears, plums, peaches, and, and several other different fruits. So. These trees are, are just a little short of full production. This year, hopefully, we'll get a pretty good crop. We're also now moving on to where we're putting in fruiting bushes, so that berry bearing bushes and things like that. So we will donate most of the fruit to either the people that come down and, and pick it from the community, or it'll go to food banks and things like that. The landscape design students came and they toured the orchard. Then they kind of thought through some other things that we could add to the orchard to really make it more of a community place for people to come to. And so they drew up plans for us to be able to expand the orchard and expand the reach of what we do in the orchard. The, the architecture students from the University of Nebraska, they came out and they designed a building for us. Now we're pretty excited about this building. It's just about completed. And in the top part of that building, we actually have a classroom. And you can, they have windows in the top part of that building and you can look out on the orchard. It's really a cool view from up there. On the bottom part, we're so fortunate we have some storage for equipment. We're pretty excited about this orchard. It's uh, four or five years old. And when the trees mature, we'll actually have quite a few apples. We're expecting people from the community to come out and uh, not only pick apples, but decide they want to be a part of the orchard and do some volunteering for us. Well, a lot of the maintenance is done by uh, a few of the uh, community um, um, people that live in the community here. They're master gardeners. They have s several volunteers that take care of them. Uh, uh, the, also, the, the mowing and stuff like that is done by city staff. So, Well, it takes a few people sometimes. We do uh, some grafting. Early on, we did some, and also we do the trimming of the trees, and that's one of the main things in the, the springtime, uh, early spring. And eventually, what it's going to get down to is we'll need more and more volunteers as our production gets going uh, to actually pick the apples. Um, I estimated that we'd probably get anywhere from 500 to maybe 900 bushels of apples or apples and fruit, because we have pears and cherries and, and peaches also, but apples are the main thing. Well, I think it helps to bring the community together as much as anything. It gets people out out from the house, and, and that's hopefully what will happen with, with a community garden. People will come out and meet each other. 
You know, the trees were planted a few years ago, but you can see that some of them are already bearing fruit. We do want to say thanks to Carol Larvik for being our host in South Sioux City and are really proud of the great work that's going on up there, including students from Lincoln. Architecture, landscape design, did a lot of fun planning and building mm -hmm. up there as well. All right, we have just a handful more pictures. So this first one is for you, and this is from Scott's Bluff, Tom. It is the spiky rose gall, Ooh, and she yeah. took some great pictures, both of the exterior, and then she cut one open. Mm -hmm. uh, she's wondering what kind of insect does this? Is it beneficial or a pest, and what do you do? Prune it, spray it, or just enjoy it? I, I, well, if you're an entomologist, you enjoy the heck out of it. These are beautiful <laughs> pictures. I really like the, the one that's cut open. Mm -hmm. This is a the work of, there's a lot of insects that can cause galls, which is just abnormal plant growth to occur. And this one happens to be a wasp, a sinipid wasp. So they overwinter as wasps, they come out and uh, female will lay her eggs in the leaf as the leaves are expanding and then the leaf starts to grow around the larvae. So the larvae makes this beautiful plant structure and parasites and predators can't get to it. So it's really well protected. Uh, really is not hurting the plant. The best thing you can do is go out mid to late summer, early fall, prune them out. Don't just drop them on the ground though, take them away and destroy them. All right, thanks Tom. This is an Aurora viewer. Okay. And they have an arc, an arch in their yard. Over the years, it has grown from five feet to over 70 feet. He's tried fungicides, he's tried overwatering. He wants to resolve it before it goes into his neighbor's lawn. <laughs> this is probably the, one of the most impressive fairy rings I've ever seen, because it's like a perfect circle. It's not yeah. abnormal at all. Mm -hmm. This is, it started from not even five feet, from just a little small clump in the soil, and these fungi have just started to feed on decaying organic matter, probably thatch, uh, from the grass. And so as they feed, they just keep going to their newest food source, and they're growing at an incredibly equal rate across the entire uh, lawn. And so, yeah, it's just gonna continue to grow. Um, and release fertilizer. And um, overwatering is probably making it worse because overwatering is going to uh, produce and, and, and produce more thatch in that lawn. There's more food source in for that fungi. Um, really hard to control, as Lauren said before, with any kind of fungicides or things to try to control it. It's just gonna keep on moving and just devouring that thatch that's in that lawn. So not a lot you can do with it. It's not really gonna hurt anything though either. And you might see some mushrooms occasionally with it too, but uh, typical fairy ring, actually a beautiful, atypical fairy ring, I think. Yeah. Looks to me like something oh, nice. you painted in the turf and the kids can use Every, it as a, yeah. a goal. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, Lauren, this is a tomato question. Uh, Norfolk, and she really can't rotate, but she's been very careful. She says she cleans it. This is plant, uh, a particular one variety of tomato, which is supposed to be resistant to most diseases. She's never had a problem, but all of a sudden she's got this going on. Same circumstances, great, great until just this week, and now she's seeing spots. Uh, and, and, and this could be related to, it looked like there was some leaf cupping and stunting possibly mm -hmm. too, so it could be related to what John was talking about with just uh, environmental conditions. With tomatoes though, if you have several plants and you don't see any symptoms in the other ones and you have stunting and you have leaves that are distorted in growth, uh, that's where we tend to start thinking about some of our tomato viruses. So I would just watch that plant carefully and if it is stunted, if you do have distorted growth, uh, you might want to consider roguing it out just so that you don't have it spread to your other tomatoes. Unless that would be a cultivar response that they would look that way, but I don't think so. No, no. I don't. don't think so on that one either. All right, so you get a kind of a rotty spotty one too, right, mm -hmm. John, and this is cucumbers doing poorly, they lost some blossoms. She has some that are a little bit larger, not showing any signs of dying. She's wondering, is this temporary due to the rains or do we have an end rot going on here? Well, I think, so if we're just losing blossoms, there is actually a weather 
uh, answer to that one, and that is actually high heat. Mm -hmm. uh, so high heat can actually make, uh, if they're female flowers, we can abort them, mm -hmm. uh, and so we can actually have poor pollination or or uh, the, the flowers just abort themselves. Uh, we could also have, uh, last month when I was here, I had my, my cucumber friend and we talked about male and female flowers. So it could have been that they were male flowers and you know, they, they did their job and, and they died off. Um, and you know, we, I, think, I don't think that if there's not a cucumber, we don't really have blossom end rot. So if, if you see a cucumber and it's starting to rot from the end, it's blossom end rot. Uh, but I, I think it's probably weather related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll see. Hopefully the weather will straighten out, although it hasn't, is it, right it hasn't been doing that, has it? Well, we have announcements of fun things in the gardening world always for our viewers. And our first one tonight is the Plymouth Improvement Association Flower and Art Show, Saturday the 7th of July at the Plymouth Community Building. We have uh, numbers on the screen for more information on that one. Our second announcement for the evening is our Grow a Row produce donations. And this is for us in our backyard farmer garden. We take produce from 5 to 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. Our master gardeners handle that. They weigh it. We get that donated. Uh, and this, this last week, we had 190 uh, pounds that were uh, out of our garden. So the more we get, the, the more we can make sure that people who need that fresh produce get to eat that fresh produce. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of Swiss chard involved, <laughs> a lot of it, which is OK. All right, so we're going to do uh, just a round of regular questions. Okay. Our viewers might have seen a couple of interesting insects for the beauty pictures, and one of them with black spots or white spots on black on the underside of the wing. Mm -hmm. They were thinking that is a very unusual butterfly. What was that, Tom? That is a regal fritillary, which is, I think, what they were mm -hmm. guessing it was. A uh, great butterfly. They're, they're not... Um, very common anymore. So I mean, they are an insect associated with prairie, and they, um, you know, everything we can do to conserve them is incredibly helpful. All right. Yeah, and there it is for our viewers. Beautiful. Again. Isn't that a pretty thing? Beautiful. Yep. Okay, Bill. So we had a viewer who actually sent us a picture of a striped lawn. Okay. Very uniformly striped, mm -hmm. about this wide. Wondering is that a disease that would be stripes? Is that over something, under something, what do you think? So one thing about diseases are they usually don't happen in straight lines. So if you ever see anything that just seems to be like weird for nature, like for straight lines like that, it's probably not a disease. So usually when looking at stripes, we're looking at things like uh, um, the grass was droughty and you drop a mower over it and it may have like damaged the leaves or more likely it's something with a fertilizer. Um, if too much overlap or too much underlap or you used a, a rotary or a drop spreader and you didn't have enough overlap in there. We did that at our research plots this summer, one of our plots, and it makes some really nice stripes. So that's probably what it was. It's probably a, a fertilizer, just a little bit uh, too far apart from the prior pass. All right, thanks, Bill. Lauren, this is a broken bow viewer. Um, she has very large containers. The humidity has been very high, but very little rain. Some of her plants are molding and breaking off. Under the soil, they're in burlap with packing peanuts. She's had them outside for years. She's never had molding and breaking off on plants in her containers. Without a picture. Without a picture, it's pretty picture. hard. But there, yeah. I mean, there are some root rots and such that would rot the stem away. So um, <clears throat> it's probably just the issue of excess moisture and with the mulch maybe providing an environment that that would infect it. Um, boy, mm -hmm. just avoid overwatering. It doesn't sound like she is, but just with the humidity and if it's in rain. Yeah. So. That's all you can do with that, really. Okay, and in 20 seconds, John, talking about overwatering, oh six inches of rain in Elkhorn and tomatoes doing this, are they goners or? You can, you can wait and see if it dries out. You can see if they will pop back, but you know that root damage is done, so you, you have to, to just wait and see.